Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're not sending you. They're not sending you. They're sending people that have lots of problems, and they're bringing those problems with us. They're bringing drugs. They're bringing crime. They're rapists. And some... So, we all have all sorts of biases that favor our own group over other groups. But some biases are less respectable. Some people have biases about skin color, about national origin, or about religion that play a huge role in our lives. Where we carve our world into inner group and out group. So, what goes on when some people are so racist to other people? Like the examples that were shown before. One ingredient of it, I think, is dehumanization. Dehumanization is the psychological process of demonizing the enemy, making them seem less human and hence not worthy of human treatment. So they're seen more as things rather than humans. Which um, motivates a sort of an immoral indifference. So if you want to ignore the fates of other people, uh, dehumanizing them is a great way to do so. Here are some examples of dehumanization. The first example is of Stephen Adams calling the Golden State Warriors, which is a basketball team consisting of black players, he calls them quick little monkeys. And here's the example. I don't envy guys, mate. They're quick little, quick little monkeys, those guys. The other examples are just random tweets that I found on Twitter. <laughs> She comes from a multi-ethnic background and she's going to be telling us her story. Um, so my mom is from Tanzania and East Africa and my dad is from Oman. Oman, as in Oman, not Amman, right? Uh, yeah, Oman, uh, Masqal. And uh, when I was in grade uh, 5 uh, through 5 to 6, I used to face uh, racial discrimination from my peers because of my skin color and uh, my skin color to the Armanis is what is known of now as black so I looked very different amongst my peers uh, I appeared a bit like brown and not compared to them who were white and uh, because of my ethnic background I had uh, afro hair and uh, my peers used to call me cotton candy and cotton candy because of how the, the candy shape is like it has an afro appearance and uh, all my friends used to call me that and also including people who weren't my friends um yeah i was called cotton candy i'm sorry Khadija, you had to go through that however thank you for sharing your story with us you're welcome it's my pleasure after going through these studies, we concluded that dehumanization plays a huge role with the racial bias, and we're going to be going through these three studies in this short documentary. The first study was conducted in 2008 by Philip Goff. It was called Not Yet Human, Implicit Knowledge, Historical Development, and Contemporary Consequences. Uh, they investigated if it's possible that at the same time that contemporary racial bias has been more subtle, these extreme forms of dehumanization, such as describing black people as apes, nonetheless remain. The four studies were conducted and undergraduate students were used as participants. The first study, the researchers tested the principal hypothesis, which is if there exists an implicit association between blacks and apes. In studies 2 and 3, they tested the bi-directional strength of this black ape association. In study 4, they um, argued that the black ape association is maintained through implicit knowledge. The authors concluded that the studies provide evidence of a bi-directional association between blacks and apes that can operate beneath conscious awareness yet significantly influence judgments of people. Study 2 was conducted 
in 2004, also by Philip Goss. It was called The Essence of Innocence, Consequences of Dehumanizing Black Children. Uh, it examines whether black boys are given the protection of childhood equally to their peers and the possibility that the protections of childhood are diminished for black children in contexts where they are dehumanized. They conducted five studies. Uh, study one tested whether black children are afforded the privilege of innocence less than children of other races. Studies 2, 3A, 3B used undergraduate and police officers to test the hypothesis that the presence of anti-black dehumanization facilitates the perception of black male children as both older than the age and less innocent than their peers. Study 4 tests three predictions in a single study by examining the difference is exaggerated where black children are dehumanized and essentially mediates the relationship between dehumanization and harmful perceptions of black male children. The authors concluded that uh, the studies presented provide a disturbing portrait of the effects of racism on black children in the United States. Study 1 provides the evidence that black children are afforded the privilege of innocence to a less extent than children of other races. Study 2 to 3 demonstrate that black boys are seen as more culpable for their actions as in less innocent uh, within a criminal justice constant than their peers of other races. Uh, in addition, black boys are actually misperceived as older relative to peers of other races as well. Furthermore, the researchers uh, provide evidence that in undergraduate and police populations, these racial disparities are predicted by the implicit dehumanization of blacks. In addition, these findings demonstrate that dehumanization of blacks not only predicts racially disparate perceptions of black boys, but also predicts racially disparate police violence towards black children in the real world settings. Finally, study 4 demonstrates that implicit dehumanization can facilitate these racial disparities. So why do people dehumanize other groups and other people? Psychologically, it's necessary to categorize one's enemy as subhuman to legitimize um, increased violence or justify the violations of basic human rights. Moral exclusion reduces restraints against harming or exploiting certain groups of people. In severe cases, dehumanization makes the violation of generally accepted norms of behavior regarding one's fellow man seem reasonable or even necessary. The majority group must be made to feel like this minority group is a threat to their health or their safety in some way. A prime example of this is Trump's language used when discussing illegal immigrants, specifically Mexicans, in um, the previous examples in this documentary where he says Democrats are the problem, they don't care about crime and want illegal immigrants to infest and pour into our country. Like MCC 13, the use of infest and pour into and the other languages that were said in that video like rapists and drug dealers and them being a problem, um, it makes American people feel unsafe and makes them feel as though a large number of these gang members are attempting to invade this country. Our instinct to separate ourselves from other groups is still widely apparent, especially in the United States. While this country continues to fight for a diverse and an accepting nation of equality, we are far from that reality. Continuing with racism and dehumanization might have a backlash, as shown by this study. Um, backlash research paper uh, talks about politics and the real world consequences of minority group dehumanization by Noor Kiki. She examines attitudes among minority group members, exploring how minority Americans respond to feeling dehumanized. Much of the discussion emanating from the 2016 Trump campaign for the U.S. presidency has centered on the importance of protecting American safety. Frequently, this has been paired with rhetoric framing of Mexican immigrants and Muslims in animalistic terms to highlight the threats they pose. 
The research suggests that dehumanizing statements about minority groups such as the Mexican immigrants and Muslims may help promote support for hostile policies targeted at these groups, but by making them feel dehumanized, they also further the very danger they support to safeguard again. So how can we stop this? To stop this, the psychological process of dehumanization might be mitigated or reversed through humanization efforts or the development of empathy, the establishment of personal relationships between conflicting parties and the pursuit of common goals. Khadija, she comes from...